Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, young and old, big and small, and welcome to another edition of The Daily Fringe Show, uh, the greatest source of news and analysis in South Africa. And today, I'm uh, very happy to say we are once again joined by our uh, CEO, the CEO of the IRR, Dr. Franz Crenier. Franz, how are you? I'm well, Nick. I'm well. It's nice to be here. It's good to have you back. And Mr. Herman Pretorius. Herman, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. I, I had a cough earlier this week, but it wasn't COVID, so I mean, you know, it's the small things. Yes, I saw one of our, our viewers was asking whether it was uh, possibly the early stages of COVID, but I'm glad to hear it's not. So the, anyway, the real um, danger is, the real danger is, Nick, that tonsillitis and COVID have exactly the same symptoms. Just No, it's true. It's true. Something to watch out for. Anyway. You, did you test yourself? Do you know that you didn't have COVID? You might have had it. No, I know I had tonsillitis. I mean, I might have had both. <laughs> I'm hoping not. <laughs> well, well, hopefully, you're adding cow herd immunity, then, Herman. Um, mm. That's that's what we can we can hope for. But anyway, um, yeah. right. So we've been trying over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we, we've been inviting France on to answer this question of what does South Africa look like after 2024. Um, and I, I'll put the description, the links to those videos in in the in the description. Um, but basically, at the end of our last discussion, we reached a point where France had been laying out six scenarios uh, for how the country would turn out. We're at number six now, and that is, well, Franz, tell us about this sort of right. six scenario. There you go. This is the answer. You've suffered through two shows to get here. <laughs> We've told you lots of things about the ANC and its trends and polls and public opinion and five other alternatives. This is number six. Because you've got the background in these first two shows, let's make it 2024. You sit there, you watch, and on that results board at the IEC, ANC score comes up and it's 40 something. 48, 49, 45, 46, hard to say. It's in the 40s. These guys have lost. It's the end. The great liberation movement, more than a hundred years later, the, the 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 new dawn was not of the ANC. It heralded in, but something's changed. And psychologically, that's a very, very important moment. So many people still, I did a session this morning for some, some foreigners. They still see South Africa through the prism of what the ANC will do with it. They, they concede the corruption, incompetence, cost of B, think the government's completely insane. But they, they, they still ask, what will it do? You need to get past that. So you have the psychological break where it, the, the, the question changes to not what will the ANC do, but what will be done now. And in the immediate aftermath of that, there'll be some sort of coalition. Not necessarily, we've gone through the arguments, would it be EFF or whatever? There'll be some sort of coalition. But if you put together a coalition of shambolic people you or, or B-grade people or, or not great people, which is you know, unfortunately the thing, you, you, don't get a, you don't get a great result. By, by putting a, a group of, of sort of hopeless politicians in one tent together, you don't get the opposite of hopeless politicians. You, you get a, another big mess. And we suffer through this mess. All the while, public opinion may, remains moderate center-right, which is what it is at the moment. It stays that. And you take, it takes only one philanthropist to decide this is a total disaster. And I'm prepared to put a billion rand behind something fundamentally new. Not digging up old Tabo and Becky's administration, as someone asked us about recently. Could they save us? Can't they? They help put us where we are. <laughs> not going to fix it. And 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 etc. A billion rand or two. Now that's the amount some philanthropist donated to the to the mask and face shield fund for COVID. It's easy to do, lots of rich people in the country. You take that behind a management team that sells a message that sits to the center right 
of the political equation where it will resonate with the rank and file. It's brand new. It's a brand new leadership. It's chief political lineup of people who are not career politicians. They don't need to be. They've, they've gone into service of the country by joining politics. It's really sort of movement of, it, it, it will have a strong sense sort of black conservatism behind it. It's a deeply ingrained political philosophy in the country. It goes all the way back to the black consciousness tradition, which, which in the sense of black man, you're on your own and I write what I like is, 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 is in the essence of it, not fundamentally different to classical liberalism or what sort of conservatism in the West. With a vast amount of money behind it, because money and political success go together, it's a fact of how things, how things work. Vast money behind a center-right movement. You fill the political vacuum. That vacuum is so big, as we said in the previous shows, that there are more people who are eligible to vote but don't than the number of people who vote for the ANC. This thing is new. It is not the old guard coming together. Some of them will join it in some form of coalition. The public will be so relieved to see there's something new and sensible, not this old tired variations on the theme of the ANC's approach to governance. Unites black and white together. It triumphs in the, in the, it grows in stature into the election of 2029. It triumphs in, in that year and it leads South Africa with great success into the 2030s where we replicate the high growth rates, improving living standards and general all-round uh, uh, goodness of some of what we experienced in that first decade after 1994. That is the sixth option. That is South Africa's way out of trouble. I think it's the most compelling. It's not as far-fetched as you think. I must emphasize this. You think it's too far-fetched. Oh, it's a dream. It will never happen. Make it practical. Public opinion is right for it. This is what people want. They're not all a bunch of crazy left-wing lunatics that read the Mail and Guardian. They're good, hard-working, decent, sensible people who just want the chance to get ahead in life. The state and activists deny them that, number one. Number two, the ANC is sinking. It is sinking. It's getting less support. You can measure it. And, and this budget of today is such a complete disaster. Running out of money always brings governments down. But there's, I mean, some of the business press will be polite. Oh, they try to balance it and maybe they'll get the debt curve down. It's a lot of nonsense. It's impossible. But the policies, the, the greatest policy of the government on, on the agenda is expropriation, which is essentially a tax increase to 100% on capital investments and business. This is going to reduce the deficit. It's not going to do that. This is, this is silliness. It's not going to happen. So the ANC is on its way out. The moderation's there. We remain a free society. The three of us can say all this, this, this very uh, provocative and counter-revolutionary stuff. Probably not going to be dragged away by the police tonight. Probably couldn't find us if they'd looked for us. And um, you add those factors together. This is not as far-fetched an outcome as people think. And the trigger for it, will be ANC defeat, because that I now think is necessary just to get influential people to think outside of the narrow confinement of acceptable opinion that ANC hegemony has forced upon this country over the past 20 years. So there's finally three shows into the third show. There's the answer, Nick. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Okay, so I, I just have a number of clarifying questions. The first is, when you say center-right, could you just say, I don't know, like the four positions that will sort of headline this party? Like what what, what kind of will define it as being center-right? Uh, you, you, you can do what you like as long as you don't hurt another person. You can think whatever you choose to think. The state should create conditions where, where, where uh, the economy can grow and good education can be found, but it doesn't have to provide that. Just as to as to as to create the circumstances for it, um, and and uh, to a very great extent, uh, people, citizens, communities should be left to their own devices to 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 build strong and stable communities. So it's the opposite of the command economy left wing sort of a thing that's seen in South Africa. The number of people with social grants 
or the number of social grants paid now exceeding the number of jobs in the country as one of our viral on WhatsApp charts suggested. And, and if that was such a wonderful thing, like such a Valhalla, we've now got more grants, more welfare. I mean, I can just see, see, see the left wing of the Democratic Party in America salivating at the prospect. Can you achieve such a great thing? We can have more welfare in America than jobs will. If that's such a so wonderful, why is the ANC getting smoked after it's achieving that? Because it's not right. so wonderful. It's not what people want. It's what sociology professors suggest and the male and guardian people want, which is about as far from reality as you could possibly get without a complete suspension of disbelief. The the so this is it, it's it's a capitalist society, in other words, with a small and effective state where people are left to get on with 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 what they do best. Um, uh, that, that, that's it. There, there's a, still a state. We're not libertarians, like our some of our. Well, we have a perhaps a fringe that hangs around the sort of corners of the organisation, but we're not libertarians. There's still a welfare system. It's very important. Desperately poor people are helped. There's still empowerment policies. But empowerment policies help people get education and, and help uh, 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 entrepreneurs uh, get going. Empowerment policies don't segregate the country on lines of race and pour billions of rands into the hands of the black elite on behalf of sort of a, a sort of on, on behalf of, of, of millions of poor people. I mean, that's not empowerment. So, so this isn't some sort of libertarian. Uh, uh, independence movement, anything of that nature. It's really, Nick, not very far away from what uh, Mandela set up under gear in the 1990s. Uh, you know, it was written, the ANC wrote on gear that social development must be funded through growth and not through borrowing. It's own words. Now what you heard today in the budget is whatever, I mean, the man said in practice, it's, it's through borrowing and not through growth. I mean, they, they've turned 180 degrees. Just prag simple, pragmatic, get the state out of things where it has no place to be, create a, a circumstances for prosperity, a support the poor and let people get on with it. That's what it means. That is center right in the world today. That's what's called neoliberal right wing, all those slurs. It's actually a damn good thing, and it is. We can prove it what the great majority of South Africans want. So, Herman, uh, what do you think of, of what France has laid out here? How likely do you think it is as a scenario to uh, materialize? Oh, well, thank you for giving me the easy question about likelihood. That's really the one I wanted. <laughs> uh, I'm now going to very elegantly swerve that question and say things that I wanted to say, and hopefully I can you know, convince myself to approach uh, something resembling an answer. Um, I think- and Don't swerve well, too much, Herman, or I will badger you. <laughs> Ah, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll get used to it. Um, the, one thing that one must understand is that the status quo always appears stronger than it is. Um, we saw this actually very much with with a um, uh, with a national party, with our apartheid regime, is that, you know, uh, one of the very earliest examples that I heard France mention in public speaking is the in August 1985, you've got P.W. Buerta saying you will not lead white South Africa and other minorities down the road of abdication and suicide. Less than 10 years later, you've got Nelson Mandela walking onto the pitch at Ellis Park with 40,000 white South Africans chanting Nelson, Nelson. So the, 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 on that point of, 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 you know, the status quo being liquid is something that South Africans must really, really understand. Because the moment you buy into the status quo dominance, you're a bit, you're a bit screwed. The second thing is once that... Um, um, erosion starts happening, I think you will see a significant shift, uh, especially in corporate South Africa, because corporate South Africa has a, has a tendency of buddying up to the government in a way that is, is, is you know, uh, it, it'll make some Amazonian urethral infection look uh, uh, healthy, because you know, you've got this thing that they are so far up the colonic system of the, of, of the ruling party, that they really cannot see themselves separate from it. The moment that colonic system starts failing, then they will be quite panicked to understand that they have positioned themselves incorrectly. That is what we saw, I think, in the 1970s and 80s with much of the corporate movement suddenly, you know, swinging uh, uh, its, its, its loyalty. And that came about through pressure. So I think once you understand the, the liquidity and the, the 
of the status quo. You really can, can start understanding what's going to happen. And then on corporates, they will follow that sort of thinking at a dramatic pace. It's exactly right, Nick. It's exactly right. And the 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 when when the or Herman describes so uh, uh, vividly are, are rejected by the system into which they have now in, in in sort of embedded themselves. The 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 effect will be cathartic to carry on with the 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 the, the, the line of thinking. It's it's exactly right, Nick. Um, and you know, in in, this, in in the larger scheme, you can almost say to people, you know, especially if you watch the budget this afternoon, you can say to them, in the bigger scheme, yeah, you, you your life is tough. South Africa at the moment is very hard for even middle class people. We concede that we're not flippant. We don't dismiss that hardly. Completely the opposite. But in the longer run, you know, rejoice because there is actually now an end game that's that's in sight. And this budget stuff uh, this afternoon was so critical in making the case for that. The, the the deficit, which is the difference between what the government spends and it earns, in so it spends a lot more than it earns in tax, that deficit now has only been rivaled three times in South Africa's history as a country since the formation of Union. The, 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 the most recent time was in the late 1980s. As in the aftermath of the speech that Herman describes, as apartheid collapsed and economy collapsed under Pierre Vierbuerta because it ran out of money, prompted the reforms. To go back to when we were last at such a deficit, you have to go back to the administration of Smuts, who was defeated in the context of the very deep deficit, equivalent to today, that ensued from the Second World War. And you say, well, when was the first time this happened to South Africa? The answer is the First World War. This is this is the hole these guys are in. It's a hole of their own making because they've hounded investors out of the country. And the effect of that is rapidly becoming, the faster the ANC doubles down on its policies, the more enthusiastic it gets about expropriation. The effect is that it just cuts off huge avenues of revenue into the state. Chases people. The finance minister, who's got his merits, said uh, in the run up to this speech that he thinks most whites are racist. Now, these are people who are paying a significant amount of the tax. That's the only thing keeping you in power. It's no different to the contempt that the ANC shows for, still within the ranks, they don't say it as much, for the clever blacks. Remember that term coined by Jacob Zuma. Mm. These guys are at the end of the road now. They're creating every opportunity to drive them out of power uh, because their policies are doing that. I, I, we wrote in a note earlier today that the ANC is bringing about its own demise and the deficit through its own policies faster than any organization with malicious intent towards it could possibly do. There's a, a chap, uh, I don't know if he wants to be identified, uh, said recently along, uh, some time back over, but but recently in the greater scheme of things, that, that you know, in, in government, the ANC has done more damage to the country's electricity network than it was its policy, than when it was its policy to blow it up. This is where we're headed. So if you've got that longer term sense, hang in to South Africa now. The window for change is opening very quickly. We still have to take advantage of that. It's not just it happens on, don't sit on your ass and it happens all on its own. It takes vast amount of citizen activism to put pressure on influential people to bring about the circumstances to ensure the next transition. But if there is going to be a next transition, we're damn close to it at the moment. And it's our best and only chance of, of 10 years from now, five years from now, sitting in a position on a show like this, we could tell our viewers with great sincerity things are definitely starting to look up. The potential for that is there now more than it's ever been before. It's actually very exciting. It's actually very invigorating. And, and, and something, some, something that, that, that I have to add here is that that is going to require that we're going to go past, that we have to go past this nonsense of I'm staying. No, I'm, I'm staying is probably the most frustrating hashtag or theme or social media idea that I've seen in the past few years. It's the ostrich way of really looking at the future of South Africa. 
we must go from beyond I'm staying to I'm, I'm standing for something. Um, and, and it's sort of sad that our opponents in the battle of ideas um, understand the power of ideas far better than we do. I mean, there's a reason the fascists always shoot the authors and the thinkers and burn down the libraries first, because they understand the moment people start to popularize or envision a world without their ideas, it's the, that's the moment that erosion kicks in. And if you look at the polling of R.W. Johnson in his brilliant book, Fighting for the Dream, that is, uh, 2019, I think, he makes the point there that even a majority, more than 50% of ANC members, want more market-based economic policies. So when France says, you know, public opinion is ripe for it, people cannot dismiss that, um, because if they do dismiss that, then they are buying into this idea that the status quo is dominant and change is, uh, is, is not possible. And, and the last point, Pat, so I think if you're frustrated at the state of South African politics, I think it's a general rule across the world that good governance breeds good opposition, bad governance beats bad opposition. So that's a cycle that this new entity, if it, if it materializes, will need to break. No, so, I got so excited, Nick. I threw my microphone on the. <laughs> um, I, I the, think that's what you call a mic drop. I'm staying at what I'm staying. You know, it, it's 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 if if I'm staying, I'm staying can be dangerous because it's kind of it, it can say I'm prepared to put up with all this crap as long as it takes. If I'm staying means I'm going to fight these people and these terrible policies that cause such harm to the poor and the downtrodden and everyone else, then it's very enabling. But, but as you said, at Harriman, I, I recall the image I was sent by a friend of a, a young South African at, at a protest in London with her I'm staying T-shirt on, and I thought that, <laughs> that, that kind of does it. I don't have one, and I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking to you from South Africa. Uh, so that kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Yes. So, so there's two things uh, as as a kind of way of pushback that I want to uh, see, see if we can get through in eight minutes. Here's the first one. So we've seen sort of attempts by forces outside of you know the general political class or whatever to to kind of push their way into politics and set up something. Um, of course, currently we've got Herman Mashaba's party is probably the most prominent of those. Um, from my personal experience with working with Mashaba, I'm not too optimistic as to its ability to succeed, but they seem to have been taking actually a lot of what you're saying on board. They're trying to market themselves as center-right. Um, so I, I'm assuming that they're not going to really make it, that they won't be the, the unit that you're looking for. Uh, I guess my question is, where will these the leaders of this movement come for? A lot of very skilled and talented South Africans have left the country or are sort of semi-invested in other places. Um, can you think of someone off the top of your head you know, no, you mustn't, mustn't try. The moment maketh a man. Uh, that's how this stuff works. Or, or woman. Um, it, it, that's how this stuff works. At the end of apartheid, you wouldn't look far ahead and, and say, oh, it's definitely F, yeah, he's going to be it. There were many others that were greater likelihoods. You, when when uh, China was attempting to escape from Maoist oppression, of pick Deng. Obviously, it was Deng. And a famous study, in fact, a case study of this very phenomenon in the scenario world, which some of you know is, is, is where I spend some of my time, is of a scenario team of great prominence identifying in the 80s that a man by the name of Gorbachev was very interesting and that if he had his way, it could bring an end to the Cold War. And this team was so prominent, given its success in predicting things like oil prices, that they were asked to brief the CIA. And the man, the leader of the team, recalls that when they said to the CIA that the Cold War will end and this man called Gorbachev will do it, the CIA said to them, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't have the fact. <laughs> five years, that's a quote, five years later, Reagan stood next to someone called Gorbachev and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It's the end of the Cold War. So don't try and call, people can't say this to me too. Well, who is it? I mean, name the chap and let's go and see him. It's not that. It's the circumstances that created. Because the whole mood changes. The, this kind of chat that we've had here at the moment would alarm a lot of organized business. They'd never allowed in their boardrooms counter-revolutionary, upset the ANC. They might, you know, I don't know, tax you more or less or take away your permit to have a hospital. 
when that changes, that sort of imprisoning of the mind, which which is triggered by the defeat uh, of the ANC, the whole game changes. Suddenly there's massive corporate support for this. We've got a long history as an organization. I've been there a long time, but I wasn't there during apartheid because I'm too young. But my, my colleagues of that era recall that a part of the reason apartheid survived is because the business community in South Africa supported it so very strongly. But sort of <clears throat> one afternoon... <laughs> <laughs> oh, they saw the light. It was wonderful. Where, who is this? Uh, where do we meet Mr. Mandela? And how do we sign a BE deal? Became the, 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 the approach. It turns like that. The circumstances will create the individual. The individual and will take advantage of the circumstances. You must just make sure that, that the ideas, if you... Which way do political transitions go? Because they happen all the time. Crises cause transitions. And we now have one. The budget speech was about as deep a crisis as any country could ever find itself in, regardless of how the minister cast it with this you know, cactus plant that's more or less alive or whatever the poor thing is at the moment. <laughs> uh, we could get a, if, if you got a sort of foreign cactus plant, it would be a quite a good sort of description of where a lot of the South African economy has gone. Um, where a bonsai. Well, yes. Well, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a dead bonsai tree. It really is terrible. But, but you, we're not flippant about it. It's just that it is so terrible, Nick. How badly South Africa is governed that if you don't sometimes try and see the amusing side of it, you'll go crazy. The, the, you get the which way does the transition go? It's not left to chance. The direction of a transition after the catastrophe always follows who had the greatest influence on public opinion in the run-up to that transition. That's why 94 was such a success relative to, to what apartheid had been. And socioeconomically was a success too. And we became a free country. Look at the things I'm able to say this afternoon. You can't dispute this stuff. That's that's how you determine it. So don't sit back. Don't be complacent. Don't think someone else is going to do it for you. You've got to get involved, but you've also got to understand now that we are closer to the solution. This comes from us. We're not the good news, guys. We're not the people who ever told you South Africa is <laughs> great because someone in Worcester baked the biggest chocolate chip cookie in the world, which is the kind of stuff that appears on the good news websites. We're, 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 we're hard-edged. <laughs> Cautious analysts. But the way we read it now is an incredible window of opportunity has begun to open. And one that could very easily lead South Africa into a great future. But the means by which we get there will be completely different to what the great majority, almost without exception, of diplomats or business people or journalists, whoever it is that I speak to, Think they don't even understand what the real option is. This is the real option. It can work. It can work very well, Nick. So, Herman, um, I do want to ask one last question. We don't have a lot of time, um, but this is something that keeps coming up in the comments, and this is a theory that there's a seventh scenario, and that is that election comes 2024. The ANC knows it's going to lose, and so it's deployed all of its people into business and and, and the IEC and everything else and it steals the election, and it bunkers down into a more authoritarian state. Why is that not going to happen? Uh, Herman, you, you can, look can, like you're desperate to I, say something. Can so. I perhaps... Yes, I, I just need to jump in here. The two, let's look at the Zimbabwean uh, example uh, of the 2008, I think, elections, um, where international observers told Morgan Sangira, I personally, you are winning this election, but the results, the results are telling you you're losing and Songhe and I didn't make the move then. He had a window of opportunity where he could have done something. Why? Because he wasn't sure whether he had the popular support. He wasn't sure whether he would get the buy-in from the people to challenge the legitimacy of the election. So even within that nightmare scenario, you end up in a way that the only antidote to it is the battle of ideas, making sure that the ANC will be so out of step when it steals an election, that its legitimacy will be significantly compromised in the mind of the citizen. 
And if I may yeah. say a very brief thing, Connie Mulder was supposed to be leader of the National Party. He didn't become it. Um, if the circumstances, um, if, if, if we have to go out and find that leader, then that leader is not the right leader. The leader is the person who will themselves identify the moment that is necessary. If we have to approach someone, by definition, that disqualifies them because they wouldn't have seen the opportunity. Uh, the answer, Nick, is Zimbabwean civil rights activists left far too much to chance. Uh, not nearly enough was done to shape the institutions, the climates of opinion, etc., to deny those options to the Mugabe regime. Same naivety as here. People think it can't happen, won't happen. You've heard it a hundred times. The Constitution so wonderful. Uh, we can't have a crooked election or... Constitution was so wonderful, you also couldn't steal whatever it was, X billion rands of face mask money or whatever was stolen. Uh, to 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 you couldn't have Jacob Zuma. That wouldn't be impossible. He'd be in jail at the moment for contempt if the constitution was so wonderful. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So no, you've got to make sure that you have the organized citizenry and activists and think tank infrastructure in place, that you cut off those options uh, to, to ruthless politicians. And Zimbabwe and activist community and the people around them, frankly, didn't work hard enough to make sure that that was the case, and therefore they lost. This is what can be different in South Africa's case, and why on, on the South African side we can win. We can win the the, the the this 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 issue. So, in other words, something to guard against. Yeah, eternal vigilance. You know the quote. Yeah, it's the only don't, guarantee of liberty. Don't think someone else is going to go and do it for you. Right. You know, if you're not actively in this game, you're an actively taking. You're just an observer. You're not part of the solution at the moment. Get in the game. Harriman's got a WhatsApp number there over his shoulder. Send a WhatsApp. We're one of the players in that game and we're actively working to bring about a better country. We need your support. No one else helps us do this. If not in, get in and join. If, so if, you, if also just for yourself, it's such a terrible thing to look at the country today and see what could be. It's vastly empowering to take a physical step towards making it better. Do that now today you will feel better about yourself and you will join the 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 the, the thousands of other people who actually decided they're not going to just let events wash over them they're going to take that first step towards influencing the future trajectory if you get enough of those you can virtually guarantee that it's going to be for the better and two well, things I'm afraid, uh, afraid, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be very quick I'll be very, very, quick. very, quick. Before, very quick. Before you before you win the vote, you must win the argument. If you look at Battle of Ideas movements throughout history, that one, you look at the Christianity, you look at the abolitionists, those were people who became involved. Peter 3, verse 15, if someone asks you about your hope, be ready with an answer. If you can't answer why you believe in freedom or liberalism, then you're not fighting the fight. Awesome stuff. Thank, Thank you very you much, gentlemen. Me. Um, France will be back on the show tomorrow uh, uh, with, with Gabriel to talk about the budget in, in more depth. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, and we will see you on the next episode of The Daily Friend Show. Thanks, everyone.